The story begins with strange creatures flying in the sky and many people on the ground. Sharp rocks surrounded them, and a blue light shone inside. A man was breathing heavily, a large sword in his hands. He wondered how many more would have to die for this phase to end. The man was clearly out of breath and tired from the fight, with bruises on his face. He was looking at a huge monster that resembled a dragon. The monster had a huge mouth with fangs, and its body glowed slightly through its scales. A ball of blue energy began to form in the giant's mouth. He thought that he didn't understand it. He couldn't predict the giant's actions anymore. A guy with black hair also participated in the battle. His face was covered in blood. He frowned and shouted loudly that they couldn't all die here. Those who survived must use the portal. However, the man in red clothes did not agree with him. He said that was out of the question, because if they left, they would put the villagers in danger. The armored man told the captain that it wasn't time to give up yet and asked him to look away from him. Something was glowing in the sky, leaving a yellow trail behind it. They were standing in front of the monster when several people in beautiful white armor suddenly appeared. The guy said it was the first planning group's troops. The man with black hair wearing a hood told everyone to follow him. He looked serious and strong. The squad immediately joined the battle, and the system notified the main character that 30 seconds had passed since the start of the battle. The first phase was cleared. Then, one minute and 45 seconds passed, and the second phase was also cleared. The system notified him that four minutes and 18 seconds had passed, and the third phase had been cleared. The dark-haired guy looked at the monster seriously, then frowned and said he accepted his punishment. A blob of blue energy began to appear in the monster's mouth, with a strange magic seal around it. A screen appeared in front of the guy, saying that Kang was connecting a berserker. The monster screamed loudly and the main character moved towards it. The ground was falling under his feet. He swung his sword, which had a strange glowing pattern on the blade, and shouted at everyone to move back. The tanker must join the battle. The system notified him that the user had applied the skill. A strong, destructive stream of energy came out of the monster's mouth. It was like Sisyphus rolling a boulder to the top of the mountain. A beefy man in huge armor held up a large shield, protecting his companions from the monster's strike. The system notified the main character that there were victims in the Allied army while the man was protecting his comrades from the monster's energy flow. The main character jumped up and was on top of the monster. The system notified him that the user's sword enhancement had occurred. He swung his sword and shouted. Then, with all his strength, he struck it into the monster's head, shouting that it was the savior's wrath. He thought about how he was constantly fighting the monsters of the game he had created with his own hands some time ago. The clock showed that it was 9.10 in the morning. The main character held a paper in his hands and told everyone that this way, they would make adjustments to the characteristic six of the bosses before launching. The bespectacled man thought for a moment, then asked if he should do it. The man in the short sleeve shirt rubbed his chin thoughtfully and expressed concern about the boss's stats. Without making and gaining purchases, it was impossible to defeat them. The main character was a boss and his name was Asio Sahayak. The man asked if he thought users would immediately start logging out of the game if they found out about this. This man was also a boss, and his name was Wu. I sighed and asked how many years the new fantasy game had been in development. Wu scratched his head awkwardly, smiled, and told him it was about five years. The main character reminded him that they had a release coming up soon and asked if he was going to cover all the expenses during that time. Wu frowned in frustration and fell silent. Esio pointed his hand at the big screen behind him. He told everyone that the neighboring team was doing well because their project had been a success for two years. He asked if they hadn't noticed. After that, Ku abruptly slapped his hand on the screen and told them to focus on what was really important. Users spend money when they lack something. Ku asked if they didn't come to the company for self-fulfillment. He told them it was time to focus and get serious. Everyone listened in silence. The bespectacled man rubbed the bridge of his nose with his fingers and suggested they end their meeting there. He asked the head of the planning team to stay for a while. Sometime later, Esio Sahayak was sitting across from the bespectacled man. The man called his name and then called him a fool. He frowned and asked how the future headmaster could say such things. Sahayak got angry, furrowed his brows, and loudly asked what else he could do if these idiots didn't understand anything. Did he have to tell them everything over and over again? The man told him that this was the problem because not everyone's brain worked according to the same algorithm as his. 
Sahayak rubbed his hands together and asked if he remembered how many times their project had almost failed due to the long development cycle. He grudgingly pointed out that the neighboring team started working on the game much later than them and now paid their salaries. He asked if the man hadn't noticed how his boss's expression changed from year to year when he looked at him. The man opened his eyes wide in surprise. The protagonist abruptly stood up and slammed his hands on the table. He asked if the man thought he was the only one who wanted to succeed. He told the director that he would see how he breathed life into this project. The man calmly looked at the piece of paper and told Sahayak that he needed to pretend he was playing this game. It didn't have to be like this. Sahak told him that even Pinko is a game. Pinko is a popular gambling game in Japan. Sometime later, Sahak was at his computer working. It was obvious that he was tired because he had dark circles under his eyes and stubble on his chin. He quickly tapped the keyboard keys. Suddenly, his work colleague awkwardly called out to him. She smiled and apologized for prying into his business. She told him that she had heard he had promised to pick up his daughter today. Sahak screamed sharply and opened his eyes wide. He told her that she was right. This girl's name was Rue. The main character looked at the screen of his phone because he received several messages from the kindergarten, Sonny Ray. The sender of the message greeted him and said that the kindergarten was texting him because Haru was refusing to go home again. A minute later, they texted him to say that his uncle had come for his daughter, but she was still crying. The sender asked him if he could pick her up now. Sahak was horrified and thought about how he had just seen these messages, which meant that Ju Hayek had already taken her away. He stood up stiffly, called Ju, and thanked him for picking up Haru. Ju told him that it didn't cause him any problems. He just thought Sahak was busy, so he decided to pick her up. Ju mentioned he wouldn't believe how hysterical she was, crying nonstop. But Haru was tired and sleeping now, so Sahak didn't have to worry. Sahak breathed a sigh of relief and told him it was good. After that, he ended the call and sat down on a chair. Sahak looked dejected. He stared ahead expressionlessly and thought about how everything had happened as he had imagined. He looked at a picture of himself standing in a suit, hugging a girl in a white dress. Sahak thought that he couldn't do this alone. Rue told him it was almost ten gas at night, so he had to finish his work. She hoped that then she would be able to go home safely. Sahak slammed his fist down on the table and told her that he couldn't because he needed to make some adjustments before tomorrow. He started flipping through a folder of documents and told her that he also really wanted to go home, but he couldn't afford to be so careless because their new fantasy game was about to launch. Rue opened her eyes wide and told him that it was his third month of working overtime. She asked if he could at least spend some time with his daughter today. Sahak told her that he wanted to raise his daughter so that she would not need anything. He went to the kitchen to make himself some coffee. He thought back to his recent conversation with the director who had told him that the game shouldn't be like this. Sahak frowned and wondered if the director really thought he didn't know that. He got angry, threw the coffee bag in the trash, and then thought about how the creation process should not stop. He wondered if he wouldn't have taken responsibility for their failure. The philosophy of the game is what people tell you when you go to school or fight with your friends. He wondered if this would provide him with money. Why is everyone romanticizing it? He thought this was nonsense. Sahak leaned his hand on the wall, took a sip of coffee, and thought about how they would never understand each other. He wondered if he didn't do it. Who would? He thought about how everyone would still be thanking him. Sahak rubbed his eyes with his hand because he was tired and his eyes were closing. Suddenly, he felt a strange sensation in his body and wondered what it was. He suddenly started running, thinking about how his body wouldn't listen to him. The glass of coffee fell to the floor, spilling the liquid. He felt dizzy, his vision blurred, and then he fell asleep. After a short period of time, he woke up. Sahak frowned, thinking about how loud it was. He stood up and rubbed his eyes. His clothes were different, and there was a sword at his waist. Sahak asked if he had fallen asleep at work. He said it was time for him to stop drinking caffeine. Suddenly, he opened his eyes wide because he saw that he was in a completely different place. Various people were standing next to him. They had swords and were dressed in outdated clothes. There was a small gate in front of them, and there were walls around it. He asked where it was located. Sahak looked down at his hands in a panic and said, These clothes. But he didn't finish the thought as a blue screen appeared in the air. On it was written, Greetings to all the people on the test site. We hope that your talents will be recognized and that you will gain new strength. As Sahak looked around in fear, 
A blue circle suddenly appeared in the sky. It was like a magic seal. A huge monster appeared out of it and jumped right onto the training ground. All the fighters screamed. Some of them were thrown to the sides because the monster was heavy. Two men held their heads in their hands, and the man in the black coverall asked the captain why Toy Seek was so tough. He told him that the monster didn't get tired at all. If they didn't defeat Toy Seek this time, they wouldn't be able to get a Class A rank. A man with ashen hair shouted that this was not possible because this was his third attempt. He asked the master what they should do. The blonde-haired guy, who was the captain, gave them a big smile and told them not to give up because they would find a way to defeat the monster. At this time, Sahak was running straight towards Tok. The men shouted and pointed at him. A man in overalls told his partners that Sahak was attacking alone. The captain was surprised and called him a madman. The man asked if Sahak didn't know that even if they worked together, they couldn't defeat Toy Seek. Sahak smiled as he thought that catching this monster was easy. He had created it himself, so he knew the tactics of fighting against Toy Seek. The transition exam is the very first stage of learning in the new fantasy game, which explains the importance of role-playing. If the tanker attracts the boss's attention, the dealer can destroy a simple crystal system located on the monster's back. Toysak was looking at the men, shouting loudly, while Sahak was running towards the boss from the side, thinking that now that the monster's attention was on other people, he had a chance to attack. But suddenly his plan was ruined because an iron shield flew in his direction. Sahak jumped back and was very surprised. He asked loudly, What is this? What fool set up a shield? The guy with the blonde hair was angry. He looked in Sahak's direction and asked him why he was rushing straight ahead. Didn't he know that they were supposed to strategize together in the class change exam? Sahak grabbed him by the shoulders and wanted to push him away. He told him that he didn't need to interfere with him. The captain spread his arms out to the side so that Sahak couldn't pass and loudly told him that he needed to stop being stubborn. They had to take care of the wounded first. Sahak got angry and shouted loudly at him that he was wasting his time. He ordered him to let him go. Suddenly the boss saw them and went in their direction. Sahak sharply kicked the blonde with his foot. The captain fell down and asked him what he was doing. The main character ran to the side and told him to hold the shield and distract Tok. The captain put up a shield in front of him. It glowed with yellow energy and the boss tried to break it with his purple energy. He shouted that Toysak didn't react to physical attacks in any way. At this time, the main character was climbing up on the boss's back by his leg. He thought with a grin, is the boss really not reacting? He was thinking that he knew about this because the captain was using the wrong tactics. Sox swung his sword, then slammed it hard into Toysak's back. Several crystals on the monster's back shattered, and it screamed loudly in pain. Its life count decreased. The captain opened his mouth in surprise and said that the monster's health had decreased. Sock continued to crack the Toysak crystals until a screen appeared in the air. It said that the boss was unconscious. The monster collapsed to the ground and the captain was in shock. He opened his eyes wide and said that the main character even stunned it. So, in order to defeat Toysak, you had to destroy the crystals on its back. At this time, Sok was breathing heavily, tired from the battle. In front of him was a particularly large crystal. This one glowed brighter than all the others. He said that this would be his last strike. It was time for him to go home. After that, he swung his sword and hit a large crystal, but unexpectedly he didn't break it. Sahak opened his eyes wide and wondered if his sword had bounced off. Suddenly, he remembered how he was at a meeting with colleagues back then. He told them that even during training, one should use the boss skills. When only one crystal remains, the real fun begins. But now, Sahak was in the game himself, so he helplessly put his hands to his head and asked what was he thinking. He said that this dream coincided too much with the game. After that, he calmed down and sighed heavily and then said that there was nothing that could be done about it. He called out loudly for the captain. The blonde man called out to him in displeasure that his name was Arthur. Sock told him that he would remember it. He pointed his finger in the direction of the other guys and asked him, are these really his subordinates? He told the captain to order his subordinates to take the center position as soon as possible. Arthur frowned and asked him why he should do this. He grudgingly asked him to tell him the reason. Sock got angry. He opened his eyes wide and asked him if he had seen how much damage he had dealt to the boss. He told him that he should just do what he says. Sok asked the captain what the problem was. He shouted at him that they should finish this fight faster. Arthur looked at him in silence, then called out loudly to all the participants in the transition exam. 
He told them that they should listen to him carefully. Sok folded his arms and smiled contentedly. He then thought that the captain had only just seen the one who was destined to succeed before he stopped appearing and listened to him. After all, he was the one who was able to attack Toysak, but the captain shouted to everyone that it was dangerous to group in the center, so they should immediately run away from here. Sok's face changed abruptly, his facial expressions froze, and he didn't understand what the captain had just said. And so he continued to shout to everyone that the main character is ready to risk the lives of his partners for the sake of the goal. They can't trust him. Sok called him an idiot and angrily asked the others if they had seen him defeat Toysak. He told them to gather in the center right now. The guy in the black jumpsuit told his partner that they were telling them different things. He asked him what they should do. The guy with gray hair shouted that he should do as Mr. So says because he is the most promising adventurer among the aristocrats, and the main character clearly doesn't have any manners. The captain ran to them and told everyone that they still had time. They will prepare and go on the offensive again. Sahak's face turned red with anger. He clenched his teeth tightly and thought about how he planned to deal with the boss as soon as possible and escape. All of a sudden, he opened his eyes wide and thought that if he was left alone, it would be him. But he didn't finish the thought because he heard a strange sound. Toysak woke up. It was looking right at him. Sahak stared at the monster in fright and thought that he was in a desperate situation. After that, the monster abruptly opened its mouth wide and grabbed him. Arthur turned to the monster and asked what was that? Did the boss eat Sahak? Toysik shouted loudly, and a message appeared on the screen, saying that it was applying the rotation of the carapace. The boss's body began to spin, it crawled on the ground and people around it flew away from it. The guy tried to run away and asked for help. Suddenly, the captain stood in front of him. He covered him with his shield. He frowned and gritted his teeth viciously and then remembered how Sahak had asked them to take the center position. He had tricked them. He thought about how he had decided to sacrifice them and complete the exam alone. Aso shouted that even if his body shattered into small pieces, he would never betray his comrades. After that, he hit the monster with his shield. The boss screamed again, purple energy coming out of its mouth. It looked up and continued to scream, and strange bubbles appeared on the monster's neck. The captain opened his eyes wide, and then Toysak's neck burst open. Sahak came out, slicing the monster from the inside out with his sword. He said that it annoys him. Sahak recalled a colleague asking him how to overcome Toysak for single users. He told him to think of a way to defeat the boss without help. He smiled and leaned back in his chair, then asked him what he thought about Toysik being able to eat the player. He told him that then, the character would fall into the boss's stomach and destroy the crystals from the inside. He asked him if the sight of organs would disgust people. A colleague told him that it was just a game so everything would be fine, but right now, he was in the game himself, and the monster's innards were scattered all around him. His entire body was covered in a clear purple liquid, and he was thinking that he was very wrong. A guy with white hair shouted happily about how Mr. Arthur managed to do this. He's a real hero. He even slept with the guy who was swallowed by Toysik. It was amazing. The captain was confused. He told him that he didn't, and he didn't finish the thought. He wondered about what had just happened. Who is this Sahak? How does he know so much about Toysak? Sahak wiped his face with his hand and said it was an abomination. He frowned and said that he couldn't wake up anyway. Sahak wondered if he really needed a class as well. A few minutes later, all the fighters were on their knees in front of the statue. It was a large white statue of a woman with large wings. This was the class's awakening place. Sok happily clenched his hand into a fist, thinking that since he had saved everyone and defeated the boss, he should be given the appropriate class, something like Paladin or Crusader. Arthur looked at him suspiciously, and then a screen appeared above him. It stated that he had awakened the Paladin class. Sok's eyes widened in shock. He wondered why this had happened, why was the captain given such a high class? After a moment, he calmed down and closed his eyes in concentration. As a golden glow appeared around him, he looked down at his palms and smiled, feeling the strength filling him. He was looking forward to seeing what class he would be given. After that, a screen appeared above him. Sok looked at it and fell into a stupor. He wondered what it was, but didn't finish the thought because on the screen it was written that his class was a novice K.N., Sok turned pale and asked in a puzzled voice, What is this? 
Am I a rookie knight? He quickly stood up and shouted in displeasure, reminding everyone that he had slain Toke. He asked why he got such a useless class and said he didn't even design it. Suddenly, a chest fell in front of him. The system notified him that he had received a rusty sword, a useless level one weapon. The sword dealt one to five points of damage, it was impossible to strengthen, and the sword's durability was unknown. The creation of the sword was not given due attention. No one knew when it would fall into disrepair. Sack picked up the rusty sword. It was very old and the blade was chipped and scratched. His face looked like he was dead and he thought it was all a joke. He quickly started waving his arms and hitting his head, telling himself that he needed to wake up. He must open his eyes. Everyone was looking at him in surprise. Suddenly, his self-flagellation was interrupted as a strange red blob of energy appeared in front of him. After that, a black and red screen appeared in the air, saying that he had died from overwork. Sock opened his eyes wide in shock. He asked what that meant. Did he die from overwork? He said quietly that it couldn't be. He thought that if he tried to remember, he had never seen a task window like this before. He got a non-existent class, but he felt all the pain. Sock wondered if he hadn't fallen asleep that day, but had died instead. He thought of Haru and wondered how his daughter would live. He imagined her waiting for him at home. Sok recalled how they had had a nice time together and asked what he had worked so hard for. He touched his forehead with his hand in a panic and asked, What is this place? Then, on the black and red screen, a message appeared that if he wanted to start over, he needed to complete the game. Sok wondered what that meant. He thought that in the game, it meant a hero's rebirth. He rubbed his chin thoughtfully and asked if he could come back alive if he played the game to the end. He thought for a while longer, then opened his mouth wide in fright as he remembered the huge monster with four eyes. Sok wondered if he was going to have to defeat this monster. He recalled his conversation with the director. The bespectacled man was shaking with annoyance and asked Sok if he was normal. He told him that Mammon was the final boss in the game and asked him to think appropriately. Users would die within a minute. But the main character was adamant. He viciously told him that high-level items would help players. The headmaster had told him that this boss dealt unimaginable damage. But Sok grudgingly told him that if a player had decent items, anything was possible. The bespectacled man asked him if he had any idea how long it would take to upgrade the equipment to such a high level. Sahak told him that he could just buy enhancement stones. The man got angry and asked him what he thought about players who don't donate to the game. Sahak asked him why he was so concerned about them. The man turned red with anger and started cursing loudly. Then, he pushed him out of the room and told him to get out and go to the business team. Sahak thanked him and said he took it as permission. After some time, a colleague asked him in surprise, Is it really possible that he offers to create a mammon with ten phases? He looked at the documents and asked, Did the director really approve of this? Sahak smiled and answered affirmatively. He told him that since the monster's appearance changes with each phase, they should make ten images. The man fell into a stupor. He thought of the boss with ten phases and wondered where such a thing even existed. He smiled contentedly and told him that they wouldn't have to play this game. They'll get a salary and a stock option, which is all they need so they should just continue to follow his instructions. After that, he left and the man frowned, thinking that ten phases were already too much. At that moment, Sahak himself was caught in the game. He thought about how he didn't seem to be going home to Haru. Suddenly, his thoughts were interrupted as other fighters approached him. The white-haired guy laughed and asked him if he was a newbie knight. He told him with a grin that it suited him. The dark-haired guy pointed his finger at him and told him that Mr. A.O. had saved his life, so he should be grateful for it for the rest of his life. The guy with the white hair was laughing. He told the captain that they were done with the class change so they could leave. He asked if it was true that Sahak would somehow survive. Ao frowned, looked at Sahak, then told the guy that it was true, and they shouldn't worry about him. Sahak wiped his face, sweating, and wondered what he should do next. He thought about the fact that the captain had received a paladin class, which only 5-10% of the users of the beta version of the game got. He couldn't let it slip away so easily. Sahak asked him if he thought his name was Asso correctly. He quickly ran to him, put his arm around his neck, and smiled happily, asking if he got a paladin. He told him that only a man of courage could throw himself right into the boss's clutches to protect his friends. He thought he could handle it. 
The captain opened his eyes wide in surprise and asked him what he meant. Sahak gave him a thumbs up and told him that fate had brought them together in this exam, so they needed to keep it up. He was counting on it. He thought that he didn't need to be proud right now because his main goal was to go home. Arthur gritted his teeth in anger, then kicked him and told him that he had to leave. He didn't need a man like that who treated his comrades like things. He's still making his butt hurt. Sahak fell down and called him an idiot. After that, he quickly stood up and shouted that he didn't care about them. Let them go. They'd have to see how they'd manage without him. Without the person who kept them all alive, they would soon regret their choice. He abruptly sat down on the ground and thought about how he needed to think things through first. Sahak looked at the rusty sword and thought that despite the differences, he could tell he was in the game he was working on. Judging by Toke, there were no significant changes in the game's strategies and system. He didn't understand why he was here, but he'd be back as soon as he got past this game. Sahak put the knife back in its wooden case and thought that he should definitely try it. Suddenly, a green screen appeared next to him. It was written that a rusty knife was placed in a scabbard, so rusty crumbs fell down and the sword durability decreased by one point. Sahak was startled, then flushed with anger and thought about changing his weapon. After a while, he was walking along the road when an old man called out to him. He asked him why he was going there. They were standing in a small settlement, and outside it was a huge mountain. The old man told him that the novice village was on the other side, so he had to go back. The road outside the exam field is difficult and dangerous. Sahak turned to him and told him to listen to him. After that, he frowned and viciously told him that he didn't need to pry into other people's business. He walked on, and the villagers behind him started discussing him. He was thinking, is there any point in wasting time in the novice village? Sahak smiled and thought about the fact that the Easter egg in the form of a powerful crink created by the developers is right here. It was a risk-taker sacred sword. The sword has outstanding attack power and inexhaustible durability. It was an S-class item that even beginners can use. He went towards the exit of the village and said that he had created this sword with the expectation that the old players would have nothing to do and would be able to find it. But now this sword would be his. The sword is located in an abandoned village that no one can find due to cyclical volcanic eruptions. After a while, Sahak came out of the forest. He was wearing a green hooded robe and looked up happily and smiled. Then he said that he was there. There were many houses in front of it, and behind it was a tall volcano. He said it was a village on a volcano called Sniff. Sahak quickly ran through the village gate and thought that if he could get a good weapon, he would be able to get rid of the class penalty. Then he will be able to hire good employees, or rather assemble his team, and safely clean up. But he didn't finish the thought and thought that it would be more accurate to say achieve the goal. He was smiling as he walked through the village, thinking that they were all ignorant fools, that they could work tirelessly in the rookie course, and that he would complete a hidden task that only he knew about and in no time would rise to the very top of the pyramid. After that, Sahak quickly ran forward, and a girl with long gray hair noticed him. She had a black patch over one eye. Sahak came to a small wooden house, which he thought was the heart of Sief village, the home of the Gustav family elder. Even the most avid gamer doesn't know that there is an old man living here from whom you can take a hidden task, a task created by the developers, hidden in the village of CTH, a protective rite of the Elder. If you perform ER work with the Elder and watch the protection rite, they can receive a sacred blade as a token of gratitude. After that, he happily opened the door of the house and called out to the Elder. He shouted loudly that he would do whatever he asked, but in front of him was a young guy with blonde hair and green eyes. The boy opened his eyes wide in surprise and asked him who he was. Sahak asked him what it was. Where is the Elder? Where did he go? The boy frowned pityingly and told him that the elder had passed away. Sahak's mouth opened wide in shock and his face paled. He loudly asked him what he meant. He abruptly grabbed the boy by the scruff of the neck and told him that the elder was fine. He asked him why he should die. Was he joking with him? The guy was panicking. He told him that if he wanted something, he could tell him. He's the new elder of Synth Village. Sahak stopped shaking him and looked thoughtfully at the ceiling wondering if the old man had really died and handed over his duties to the boy. He thought that there didn't seem to be such a thing as fixed NPCs in this world. The new elder was trembling with fear, and Sock smiled ominously. He thought that this guy was the same elder, just a young one, which meant that it would be even easier to persuade him. After that, 
He immediately smiled benevolently and called out to the elder in a high-pitched voice. He asked him to apologize for his manners. Sahak asked him if there was anything he needed help with. The guy, in shock, asked him what he was talking about. Sahak told him that there must be something he needed help with. For example, clean up the graves or deal with the dragon of the volcano, help with the rite of protection. The new elder suddenly opened his eyes wide and told him that he needed to leave here. Sok was shocked. He asked him what he meant by that. The elder looked down and calmly told him that he had nothing to offer because no matter what he did, it wouldn't be of any use, so he should leave. Sahak frowned and wondered if he had lost his mind. Isn't there even a small job for him? He asked him if performing the elder's protection right wasn't important to the village. The guy looked down sadly and told him that he was right, but he... and he didn't finish the thought. Sok was thinking that it was sickening. He knows the strategy. All he has to do is push him. After that, he put his arm around the elder's shoulder for a bit and whispered to him that he was actually familiar with the previous elder. The guy immediately blushed with joy. He loudly asked him, Is it really true? Sok answered him in the affirmative and then smiled and told him that he could trust him and do what he told him. He thought that it wasn't a lie. After all, he was overseeing the development of this NPC. He waved his hands and told him that even an inexperienced elder who couldn't wipe the tombstone could do this, meaning that he would share all the knowledge of the former elder with him. The young elder looked at him worriedly. He wondered if he was claiming to know everything about performing the protection. Should he trust him? He thought of how the blonde-haired girl had looked at him happily, and then of how the village had been consumed by fire. He thought about how he had to do it. The guy nervously clenched his hands into a fist and thought about how he would do it, even if he had to borrow another person's strength. After that, he loudly introduced himself as Sok. His name was Gustav Rien, and he was the fourth elder of CTH Village. Gustav told him that he was giving him this task. He asked him to help him perform a protective rite. Sok gave him a thumbs up and happily told him that it should have been said so from the beginning. Of course, he would help him. He was thinking about why the young elder was taking this so seriously. After that, a blue screen appeared in the air. On this was written the name of the task, the protective right of the elder. The task description was as follows. Soon, a dragon will appear from the volcano and the village will be engulfed in flames, so Gustav asks for help with the ritual. The goal is to clear three tombstones in order to set up a barrier that will protect the village. Clean tombstones are required, so he and the new elder must put the tombstones of the previous elder in order. For this, he will receive a reward, the most friendly relations with the elder. The system asked him if he would accept the task. Sok thought that was great, because as expected, the task window appeared after he completed the conditions. Gustav Worley told him that he didn't know his name. He called him an adventurer and asked him how he could address him. Sahak accepted the task from the system and told him that his name was So Kwa Jang, but he could just call him Kwa Jang. Gustav happily agreed with him. At this time, a rat was watching them. The man was holding a transparent blue rat in his hands. It looked like a hologram. He said that the name Jang made him uncomfortable. He used Rat's Ear, an exclusive skill of the assassin class. There were two blades on the guy's back, and he had a black mask on his face. He looked at the hologram of the rat and asked Nuna if they could just get hold of the information and then kill them. It was a group of pinko bandits. Next to the guy was a girl with long burgundy hair. She said the guy was right and then asked Farah how much longer they had to wait. Farah, a girl with long white hair and an eye patch, smiled and told them that it wasn't time yet. The guy's name was Cohen, and the girl's name was Chino. Chino looked at her pityingly, and Farah told them that as soon as Young showed up in the village, he went straight to this house. She asked them if they had ever seen a traveler leaning over the village of Koth. They were on the roof of the elder's house, and Farah had told her companions that Jong probably knew how to get the Holy Blade. She smiled slightly and asked them why would they bother chasing the sword. She told them that they would just wait for the right moment and steal the blade. After a while, as Sok and the young elder were walking through the village, he asked Gustav how long it would take to reach the gravestone. The elder told him that it was not far from the village, so they didn't have much to go to there. All the locals were looking at them suspiciously, and Sok noticed this. He thought that there was a strange atmosphere here, and all the residents were looking askance at them. Suddenly, a tomato flew into Gustav's head. Residents started throwing tomatoes at him and calling him an impudent man. 
The man asked him how dare he come here after what he had done to their families. The other man told him that he had to get out of here. Everyone threw tomatoes, rocks, and things at him, but one of the pots hit Sock on the head, so he got angry and loudly asked Gustav what was wrong with them. The elder calmly covered his head with a hood and quietly told him that they just needed to speed up a bit. Sock's face reddened with anger. He gritted his teeth and agreed with him, and then he thought about how he had a headache so he needed to get this over with and get out of here as soon as possible. After a short period of time, they found themselves in the forest. In front of them was a large stone statue. This was the first tombstone. Gustav happily told him that they were there. His first task would be to pull out all the weeds. Sahak rolled up the sleeves of his shirt and smiled, then told him that it was time to start the task. He told him that he thought he could do it in five minutes. After that, he started picking weeds quickly, so Gustav was a little confused and asked if he was a professional gardener. He told him that he was doing a good job of it. Sock pulled up another weed, but it had a large, thick root. He looked at it with disgust and said something that he had already forgotten, that there were weed monsters in this world. The weed started kicking and squeaking, and Sock just threw it away and said they were scarecrows in person. Everything is too detailed. It's a waste of resources. The weeds lay helplessly on the ground and squeaked, then abruptly stood up and began to run away in the other direction. Gustav looked at the little monsters in surprise, then told Yang that he thought it was enough. He thanked him and told him that thanks to him, Grandpa would sleep in peace. Everything around the stone statue was clean. Not a single weed was left. Sok wondered if he had called the man Grandfather, so this tombstone belongs to the previous elder. He looked at the large stone boulder and pondered how it could be that there were originally two tombstones here, and then another one was added later. He thought about the fact that the real picture is slightly different from the original data. This is a unique place. After that, Gustav called out to him loudly and told him that they had to go because there were two more tombstones. Sock told him he was coming. He smiled contentedly and thought that this innovation wouldn't stop him from completing the mission. He wondered if all he had to do was pull up the weeds, but after a while, they came to the second tombstone which was wrapped around by a huge monster. It was a level 5 weed king and it had 200 health points. The monster had a huge mouth with fangs, and dirt was leaking out. Sahak opened his eyes wide and turned pale. He thought about what this was. He didn't create this monster. It makes his blood run cold. He frowned and thought about how luckily it was a low-level mob so it wouldn't die. But the problem is that its equipment sucks. He pulled out his rusty sword, and the monster smiled contentedly, looked at him, and said loudly that he didn't care if the weeds fell first or if his sword shattered. After that, he jumped up and swung his sword, then called the monster a bush. A couple of minutes later, the weed king fell to the ground and the little monsters ran up to it. Sock was also lying on the ground, sighing heavily and thinking that he should get hold of the sacred sword as soon as possible. The system notified him that his character's level had risen to 10th, so his stats were updated. He stood up leaning on his rusty sword and Gustav happily told him that he had done a good job. Sahak agreed with him and said it was time for them to finish this before the sun went down. He was thinking that the Gustav family was a healer class. He wondered why the elder wasn't treating him. After a couple of minutes they set off again and the elder told him that the last tombstone needed regular cleaning so he wouldn't have to suffer so much anymore. Sok thought that a level 5 monster was enough for him. After a while, they came to the last tombstone. Gustav happily told him that they had come. This tombstone looked special. There was a small stone structure around it, and strange patterns were drawn on it. There was wind here, so the leaves from the trees were flying through the air. Sock saw a strange shadow behind the bushes, and he opened his eyes wide and turned pale. He clapped his hand on Gustav's shoulder and asked him if he was sure that the last tombstone was here. The young elder told him that it was definitely here, he also tells him in the morning that all the tombstones are not far from, and he didn't finish the thought because they heard a terrible loud sound. They both looked in the direction of the sound and were startled. A monster suddenly emerged from the ground. It had big red eyes. The monster was very scary. It was a level 50 cursed predator, and it had 25 and 200 health points. Sok asked loudly, What are the boss-level monsters doing near the village? The cursed predator looked like a crab. It had multiple legs, no face, and only one eye. Gustav, frightened, told him that it was time for them to run away, 
because this monster was too strong and they would not be able to overcome it. But Sok smiled and started to draw his sword. The young elder called out to him questioningly. He thought that Sok didn't care because he had created this monster, which meant he would destroy it. He told Gustav that he would kill the monster and that Gustav should control the amount of mana and prepare to heal him. The elder spread out his hands and told Sok that he wouldn't let him fight, as it was too dangerous. Sok replied that it was feasible since the monster would use a paralyzing skill if it looked into his eyes for more than three seconds. He held up his finger and asked if Gustav knew why the field boss would first immobilize the opponent instead of attacking. Gustav frowned in fright and gripped the strap of his bag tightly. Sok smiled and explained that the cursed predator's attack speed was very slow. If they avoided looking at it, they would succeed. Suddenly, Gustav began to shake violently, and sweat ran down his face. He looked ahead in fright and started to ask if Sok really meant to avoid the eyes, but he didn't finish the thought and pointed behind Sok. There was a monster. Sok looked back, then abruptly jumped and shouted, saying the monster scared him. He turned towards the elder and thanked him, but suddenly noticed Gustav was missing. Where did he go? Couldn't he avoid eye contact? Sok asked. He then saw the elder lying on the ground and realized it was true. Furrowing his brows angrily and clenching his teeth, Sok thought Gustav was a fool. He had told him to be careful. He planned to slowly kill the monster from a long distance. The monster walked up to the elder and opened its huge mouth, drooling. Sok held the rusty sword in front of him and thought that now all he had to do was change tactics and fight blindly. He exhaled in concentration and closed his eyes, imagining the monster's movements and attack angles. He thought about how he had been involved in every stage of creating this monster, so he still had a chance of winning. Sok squeezed his eyes shut and shouted loudly to the boss, telling it not to touch his sword, which meant the monster couldn't eat the elder. He jumped up and swung his sword at the monster, hitting it repeatedly and taking 20 health points off the cursed predator each time. Sok was thinking that if the boss's level was low, the attack would be interrupted when it hit. Even the difference in strength would not affect the outcome of the battle. He could defeat the monster without getting a single injury. Sok struggled hard, veins standing out on his face from exertion as he continued to beat the cursed predator, thinking that he didn't have much time left. The boss's health bar was gradually decreasing and the system alerted Sok that his strength was decreasing from swinging the sword. He thought he only had one more punch left. The boss had one health point remaining, so Sok thought it was great. He opened one of his eyes and tried to hit the monster again with his sword, but it suddenly broke and flew off. Sok frowned, clenched his teeth, and shouted that he had one last punch left. Suddenly, a strong pillar of light came out of the cursed predator's mouth, hitting Sok and sending him flying. He fell to the ground with one health point left out of 2500 from this strike. Blood ran down his face, and he was breathing heavily. He thought about how the monster had a strong base attack. It was a good thing there was no instant death system, otherwise he would have died. The boss wanted to hit him again, but suddenly a piece of Sok's broken blade fell not far from them, breaking even more. Sok opened his eyes wide and looked at it. The monster saw it too and was distracted for a moment while Sok drew his sword. It didn't even look like a sword anymore, more like a small knife with a large handle. It almost didn't have a blade. He thought about how they were about to find out which one of them would be the winner. Sok stood up and quickly ran towards the monster, thinking they would find out which one of them was faster. He shouted loudly, Titanic strike! and stabbed his sword into the spot next to the boss's eye. Blood gushed out. The monster's claws stopped right next to Sok's stomach. It trembled. Then the cursed predator collapsed to the ground. Sok immediately sat down, exhausted from the fight, his whole face covered in blood. He muttered that he was too old for this. The system notified him that he had leveled up to level 20, so his stats had been updated. The novice knight had reached level 20, making new skills available to him. Sok looked at the blue screen that appeared in the air, surprised. He had thought nothing was available to beginners. Do they really give you whole skills here? He asked. Three small screens appeared in front of him. The first had a sword icon indicating the beginner's swing skill, unskilled sword swinging depending on one's strength. The second screen displayed the beginner's counterattack skill, which required clumsily countering the opponent's strength, dependent on intelligence. The third screen showed the beginner's evasion skill, which, if lucky, would allow him to avoid the enemy's attacks, dependent on his movement speed. Sok abruptly stood up and waved his hands in frustration, loudly asking what kind of skills these were and why he needed them. 
With a grin, he said the system pleased him. Suddenly, a red screen appeared in front of him. It suggested that he could become stronger if he used these skills a hundred times. Sock's eyes widened, then he got even angrier and asked who was sending him these messages. What does the sender want? Does he even know who he's bullying? The red screen began to fade and an ominous sound of laughter emerged. Sock called the sender an idiot and vowed to get back at him for this. Suddenly, Gustav woke up and ran towards Sock, calling loudly for him. He asked if Sock was okay. The elder saw the monster and, in surprise, asked if it was really a corpse. Sock, very angry, his eyes burning with hatred, asked Gustav if he had really slept through the whole fight and finally woke up. He grabbed him by the head, shaking him, and with a fake smile asked Gustav if he had had a good night's sleep. Are you really looking forward to rafting on the River Styx? He laughed. The River Styx is one of the five rivers that flow in the underworld of Hades. The elder panicked and loudly thanked Sock for his hard work, then happily asked if it was time to put the third tombstone in order. Sock smiled and told him he was right. They could get on with it. He thought about how he would forget it all. He would just clear the last tombstone, watch the rite being performed, get the holy sword, and it would all be over. Sock asked the elder for a cloth, telling him he would do everything. After a short time, the tombstone was clean, glistening with cleanliness. They smiled and then together said they could begin the protective rite. They called out to each other. Sock widened his eyes in shock, pointed at himself and asked if he was going to perform the ritual. He told the elder that he should conduct it himself. Gustav awkwardly rubbed his head and said he had spent all his mana, laughing and telling Sock he would be happy for his help. Sock, blushing with anger, loudly asked what he was doing here at all. Gustav frowned pityingly, tears welling up in his eyes. He turned pale with fear and told Sock that he knew the way to perform the ritual. He asked if he had misunderstood him. Sock grabbed the elder by the scruff of the neck and shouted at him again, reminding him that they had agreed Sock would clean up everything while Gustav performed the ceremony. This is your direct responsibility, he exclaimed. Isn't it obvious? The elder, panicked, asked Sock if this meant that the knowledge the former elder shared with him was meant for cleaning tombstones. Sock was furious, his pupils narrowing. He shouted that it was impossible and demanded to know why Gustav hadn't told him immediately. Where is it written that an elder can't use mana? He shouted, accusing Gustav of making him believe he knew how to perform the rite. Gustav stared at him with frightened eyes, then looked down sadly. Sock clutched his head and lamented that all his efforts had been useless because Gustav didn't treat him. He wondered if he could figure out the problem by seeing Gustav's status bar. Suddenly, a screen appeared in front of him, indicating that the status of the interlocutor was being analyzed. Sock's eyes widened in surprise as a sign appeared over Gustav, showing that the download was in progress. He thought about how he only had to think about it, but didn't finish the thought. Instead, he opened his mouth in surprise, wondering what it was. A screen appeared behind the elder, displaying that his name was Gustav Rien, a level 49 priest. The elder had a maximum physical strength of 10,000, but at the moment, he had zero mana points out of 50,000. There was also a small graph showing Gustav's stats. Huge intelligence, good stamina, but minimal strength and luck, along with mediocre technique and agility skills. Sock was surprised, pondering how Gustav was a high-class healer with such a large mana pool. He wondered why the mana was missing, as it should recover automatically. The elder, almost crying, with his voice shaking, told Sock that no matter what he did, his mana was not replenishing and he couldn't use magic. He wept, saying he knew he was good for nothing but still wanted to perform the rite of protection at all costs. Sock, feeling cornered and gritting his teeth, wondered what to do next. Without the elder's help, he couldn't obtain the sacred blade. He contemplated if there was another way. Suddenly, the entire area shook, and the ground beneath their feet began to tremble. Sock wondered if it was an earthquake. Black smoke started coming out of the volcano, birds began screaming and flying in the sky, and Gustav, looking terrified, said he didn't want it. His face turned pale with fear, and then he abruptly ran away. Sock, not understanding, asked where he was going. As evening came, Sock sat in a tavern, holding his head in his hands, wondering what to do. Did he really need to go back to the novice village? He thought this option didn't suit him because, without a decent weapon, he wouldn't be accepted into any team. He didn't want to break away from his current path, so he had to get the Holy Sword at all costs. However, just the thought of Gustav made him angry. 
he loudly declared that he had not been hired as a babysitter. The tavern employee, holding two large mugs of drinks, saw him and opened his eyes wide. He said Sock was the same fool who was with Gustav. Then he threw a drink in Sock's face and loudly demanded to know what he was doing in his establishment, telling him to get out. The man was displeased, and liquid dripped down Sock's face. The man told him that Gustav's friends were not allowed there, so he must leave. Sock calmly stood up and asked what he had done to deserve such treatment. He then loudly called the man an idiot and shouted that from now on, all his actions would be considered self-defense. A few minutes later, the man was kneeling in front of Sock, his body trembling as he bowed. Sock asked if he had finally shown him respect. He called him a fool and told him he shouldn't have made him angry. The man gritted his teeth in humiliation and shame, silently vowing to take revenge on Sock. Sock sat down at the table, frowning. He asked why the villagers were so desperate to overthrow him. What is the problem? He demanded. As soon as the elder left the house, he was immediately pelted with tomatoes. The man wiped his face with his hand and explained that Sock didn't seem to know about Gustav's actions. He warned him not to mess with Gustav because he was killing the villagers. Sock remembered how the young elder had cried and begged him to come back, saying he was good for nothing. He wondered if that crybaby Gustav was really killing the villagers. He doubted it very much. Sock told the man that it was hard to believe. He asked exactly what the young elder had done. The man mentioned an abandoned house near the village. Sock frowned thoughtfully, recalling how he and the elder had passed by a strange house. He had asked Gustav what it was, and the young elder had told him it was his friend's house, but it was empty at the moment. Sock remembered thinking that this area also belonged to the village on the game map. They had laid white flowers outside the house. The tavern owner told Sock that Gustav had killed all the members of the family that lived in that house. Some time ago, a volcanic eruption had begun. Gustav had been standing at the third gravestone with several villagers around him, telling him fearfully that the dragon was coming and that he needed to start the ritual faster. Gustav had put his hands on the headstone and panicked, telling them he was short of mana. The tavern owner had started shaking him by the shoulder, asking what he suggested they do since the dragon was almost there. Gustav began to cry, panicking and asking why he couldn't do anything. The dragon flew up into the sky, passing over them. The tavern owner, in shock, had told everyone to look at it. The young elder had shouted, his pupils narrowing, as he called out loudly for Ellen. The dragon flew towards a small house where a girl with blonde hair, wearing a long white dress and holding a small basket, calmly looked at the dragon. The tavern owner, recounting this story to Sock, told him that Ellen had been the kindest child, caring for her elderly grandfather. On that day, he lost his neighbors and the girl who was like his own daughter because the red dragon attacked them. Gustav hadn't explained why he couldn't use mana to perform the rite. If he had said so beforehand, they all might still be alive. The man wept, saying that Gustav, despite having the blood of an elder running through his veins, had undermined the villager's trust. Sock let out an emotionless sigh, placed a coin on the table, and thanked him for the tasteless beer. He told him he was leaving. As he walked towards the exit of the tavern, the man abruptly stood up and asked what kind of reaction that was. He told Sock that he had just listened to a heartbreaking story, calling out loudly, his face red from crying. Sock stopped and told him that he was asking why Gustav hadn't explained why he didn't protect them. A young boy like the elder who had lost his family was responsible for the fate of the village, he said. Did you really want Gustav to wake up right away and solve all the problems? Sock glared at him and told him he was a grown man. He asked him if he was ashamed to say that. After a while, night fell. Black smoke was coming out of the volcano and Sahak was walking through the village. He thought that all the inhabitants were selfish. Sahak wondered if they really thought he didn't know the history of this village. He remembered that the warrior who wielded the sacred sword had died and his companion, a priest, went to the kingdom to fulfill his last will. The priest wanted to help people who had lost their homes during the battle with monsters. Rallying under his leadership, they built a village called Ki-Ki. However, the village was not calm for long, as the Dragon Friday, who was sleeping on the mountain, woke up from his dream. In a single morning, Friday had turned the village's fertile land into a volcano. After that, protecting the village was the responsibility of the priest's descendants, the Gustav family. The founder of Teich village knew that one day the dragon would wake up again, so he left a protective tombstone to save the villagers. 
Creating it took too much of the caster's strength and affected his lifespan. Even knowing this, the Gustav family still sacrificed themselves to protect the population and gave people a peaceful sky above the earth. But that was completely forgotten. After a couple of minutes, Sahak arrived at the elder's house. He thought that he seemed to know the answer. The reason why Gustav's mana isn't recovering is because of his psychological trauma. A depressed state in beginners who have experienced a strong shock is not uncommon. He smiled and said that it was his specialty. He would heal the sick soul of young Gustav. After that, he abruptly pushed open the doors of the elder's house and smiled sinisterly. He called out loudly, shouting that it was time for special training. But no one answered Sahak and the house was silent. So he asked what was going on. Where did the elder go? At this time, there was a group of pachinko bandits near the third tombstone. Cohen was carrying a huge sack in his hands and then threw it on the ground. Inside the bag was Gustav, his hands tied and crying. Cohen apologized to him and told him that they weren't happy with the idea either. The young elder immediately asked them in a panic who they were and how they kidnapped him. Farah smiled and told him that they had overheard a little of his recent conversation. She asked him if, by activating the protective tombstone, he would be able to obtain the sacred sword. Gustav frowned pitifully and asked her what kind of sword she was talking about. The chief called out to her teammates, so Cohen immediately grabbed the elder and forcibly placed his hands on the tombstone. Gustav cried out in pain, and Farah told him that they had seen his status. He had no mana at all. Chino smiled, holding a small syringe of purple liquid. She told him that he didn't have to worry because one such injection would help even a 70-year-old grandfather. The young elder looked at the syringe and started crying again. Chino gave a fake smile and raised her hand to stick it in Gustav. She told him that this way he would be able to protect the village and they would have the sword. She asked him, isn't it great? Cohen told him that he didn't need to worry because his partner's skill in mixing poisons was a masterpiece. True, after this injection, he would become a fool, but it did not matter. Gustav turned pale with fear and asked them if he was going to be a fool. After that, he started shouting about how he didn't want it, asking them to let him go. Cohen continued to hold him tightly with his hands and told him that he needed to stand still. Suddenly, a man shouted to them that they needed to stop. Everyone looked in his direction in surprise. It was Sahak. He came out of the bushes and told Gustav that he thought he was practicing, so he wanted to praise him. But it turned out he had managed to get into trouble. The elder wept even louder and harder, shouting loudly for him to save him, begging his new friend to help him. Sahak seemed to be burning with rage, so he clenched his hand into a fist and asked the thieves if it was time for them to talk. Chino held Gustav by the hair. She called Sock smart and then asked Pharaoh what they should do. The leader asked her why she was afraid of a traveler with a broken weapon. She shouted loudly that Cohen should deal with him. After that, he quickly ran towards Sock. Pharaoh smiled smugly and thought about the fact that their opponent was a low-level adventurer. They exceeded him in strength, so they just couldn't lose to him. She wondered if maybe she should check his stats. Cohen was holding a beautiful blade, and he told Sock that he should have left immediately. But now, he could only hope for himself. After that, he swung his blades at the Traveler. It was a two-handed active rogue skill, Twin Vipers. Cohen hit him with his blades, so there was a small explosion, and everything around it was glowing with blue energy. Suddenly, he looked questioningly in front of him because Sock was no longer there. Chino clutched Gustav's neck as he continued to cry. She asked if their opponent had decided to run away. Cohen's body stiffened a little. He looked around in panic and thought about what was happening. He thought about how he had definitely chopped him into pieces. Suddenly, Sock appeared behind him and asked them if they had said he had run away. His face was covered in blood and he was holding a stick in his hands. He calmly told the bandits that he had completely forgotten that he had a useless thing instead of a sword. The system notified him that he was using an improvised weapon with an attack power of one. The strength of the wooden stick was 100 points out of 100. Such weapons can be picked up in the forest. He smiled and asked Cohen if they would continue the fight. Pharaoh said in surprise that this couldn't be happening. This was definitely not what they were expecting. She couldn't view the information about Sock. It couldn't be downloaded. She opened her eyes wide and wondered who he was. Holm thought that an error occurred when loading the status window, and this is impossible without a significant difference in levels. 
She frowned and wondered if this adventurer was really capable of overpowering them. Cohen glared at him hatefully, then quickly ran towards him again, and then he started throwing punches at him. But Sock dodged each of his blows, thinking that he was throwing first one backhand, then two forehands, then an overhead kick. It was too predictable, 